this is the introduction to Android course. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be building a very simple Android app. It's not really, it's not going to have any kind of connect, um, connectivity, or, and nor is it going to interface with any kind of phone services. It's going to be a very straightforward beginning. App. But we're going to start off with installing Android Studio. How many of you actually have Android Studio installed on your machine already? Good. That skips 90% of our steps. Now, did all of you who installed Android Studio remember to install Java as well? Okay, so we can skip all of that stuff. That's nice. It's very handy. So here's the app that we'll be making. Very simple app just to order coffee. Uh, this app has two different activities. One, which you can see out here in the main, in the main activity, which is where you can interface with the, button, with the increment buttons, which will tell you how many coffees you're going to order. Three check boxes, which will determine whether you want cream, milk, or sugar, or any combination of three types of coffee. Weird. Uh, and it will also show the price, but also the next activity you trigger after you hit the total will also show you the price. That's in there for a couple of different purposes because we're also going to show a few different ways you can you can pass values through to different activities using Android itself. Quick question: How many of you have uh, written Java code before? Because this is supposed to be an intro. Okay. So I'm assuming most of you know how methods work and passing arguments to methods. So we can so that'll be a, there'll be a small refresher on that in the app, but I'm pretty sure the majority will be able to get started. Okay, what you saw initially in the first part of this presentation is what's called a layout. A layout is what somebody sees when you, when you trigger an activity in an Android app. This is how your user interacts with it. So. In the case of a layout, it has to be easy to use, easy to understand, it has to be able to handle most of what you want it to initially do right there. As you saw with our simple coffee app, it had every button that you could that you would want to order coffee right there in front of you. Creating it is a little bit more complicated. All Android layouts are in XML, which is an extensible markup language. This is where we can declare all of our different all of our different views and where we place them and what kind of properties each view will have inside the app. Over here on the side, I have a very simple explanation of the basic code of what you need for a text view. Now, a text view. Switch over to my IDE here. This is a text view. Pretty self-explanatory. A text view simply shows text somewhere on the screen. Hmm. Don't know why I'm scrolling. Okay. Anyway, a text view will simply display text inside of your Android activity, and you can modify it as you see fit. You can have all kinds of parameters, such as size, whether it's bold or italicized, where you want it, all kinds of stuff like that. In order to declare something in XML, if you look up at the top here where, oh, where it says text view, there's a little carrot to the left. This entire statement, wait a minute. This statement right here is the declaration of what kind of view you're actually making. In the case that we've said several times now, it's a text view. So this is the opening, this is the opening bracket for a text view. Over here is a closing bracket for XML. How many of you have seen HTML or written some kind of HTML? Same basic concept. Any kind of tag that you open up inside of this needs to be closed at some point, or else the object, or else the object or whatever you're trying to close within those within those uh, brackets will not actually exist. So as we go further into, so as we begin to go into what views are, we need to explain what exactly holds a view and what arranges them properly. And these are what are called layouts. There are two major layouts inside of Android, which is a linear layout and a relative layout. These can all be nested within each other to help you build your layout in the, just the way you want it to be. The layout that we saw before requires, required when I built it, required, I think, if I'm not mistaken, three linear layouts. Nested within a set, nested within another set of relative layouts. Now, a linear layout is interesting in that 
when you declare when you declare your views in the XML, that's how that's the order that they will appear in your linear layout. Originally, when you set when you declare linear layout, it'll set everything into a vertical orientation, which means that if I were to declare the text view one, text view two, and text view three, they'll appear one, two, and three on top of each other inside of the activity that I declared it as, as long as that activity is viewable on the screen. In order to change that orientation, we make a cut. We make we change this parameter here. This is an is an XML line that lets me change the properties of whatever whatever. Um, view or layout I have chosen. So this Android declaration is actually uh, what SDK what SDK you're going to be using for the XML for this. There are a couple of different versions depending on which version of the Android SDK you install. <coughs> Our focus today is just very simple. So we're going to be looking at it from SDK 19, which is Android 4.4 and up, because that's a little a little under what 90% of the devices are using. So most devices nowadays will be able to run that. But um, unless you really have a reason to change that, most of the time this will actually be filled in for you initially when you declare your when you initially declare your layout for your activity. So there's no real reason to change it unless it's absolutely necessary. So this will declare that the SDK that you're using here is part is part of the current SDK that you're looking for. And this name here, where you see layout width, height, and orientation, these are all the parameters that you change. When you first declare any kind of layout, any kind of text view, any kind of view at all or layout, you have to declare a layout width and a height. So in this setup here, I have wrap content. What that means is that any content, any content that is stored within this layout, the layout will dynamically size in order to fit whatever content is in it. So I can have it, I can have something of any length provided it fits within the parent. Sometimes it can go out but then it just looks weird. As long as it fits within the parent or on the screen, the layout will resize itself in order to fit those objects. It's generally best good practice to decide that you want to wrap the content if you're not sure what size the content will be or if it's, or if it's changing size based upon input or, how, or what the user is using, what the user is doing. In our app, as you'll see later with the image view, I actually have a static layout with and like defined because I only want the image to be one size. It won't be. I can expand, I'll go further into that later on. Now back to our linear layout here. This line here with the parameter orientation, this dictates how the objects will be laid out and lined up in the linear layout. In this case, I have vertical. Again, from the text view example we had, I had text view one, two, and three on top of each other. If I were to, do, if I were to change that horizontal, instead it would lay them out in a horizontal fashion from left to right from text view one, two, and three. Any questions? A relative layout's a lot more flexible than a linear layout is. A relative layout lets you change your layout based upon relative locations on the display or in the activity XML file. So I have a couple of things in this example relative layout here, a text view and a button. So I have the relative layout declaration and I have both my width and my height declared. In this text view, I have my, uh, per my uh, property state that it's gonna center in parent. So in this case, it's gonna center itself within the center of this declared relative layout. And I'm also gonna assign an ID to it. We'll explain why, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Below that, I have a button. So with a button, this is where I can explain the ID, actually. I have an ID up here in the text view, which I just simply made label. This at plus ID means that I'm going to add this ID as a variable that I can access later on in the XML file. You can declare these in a separate file as well if you'd like. Um, it really depends on how you're going to use the app. In our case, we're just going to make it simple and declare them dynamically as we go through the XML. But anyway, when I declare my button down here, now this is this is only available within a relative layout. I'm declaring that the layout, that this button is going to be below where this text view button is. So the text view will be centered in the screen with whatever information that's going to have on it, and the button black will be below it. Unfortunately, I didn't declare a. Uh, Center to center it horizontally. Neither of these are I clear. No, 
I didn't declare the button to center horizontally. So the text view will be in the middle of the screen, but the button will be below it, but all the way over to the left. Because that's that's the lowest uh, horizontal, that's the initial horizontal location of everything that's on the screen. But since I declared this layout below, no matter where the text view goes, if I were to say I wanted to move it a little lower than the if I declared something else, say another button above the text view, put that in the center and declared this text view below that, it would actually shift my second button down so it's constantly below that text view. That makes a relative layout extremely flexible when you need to add things in the layout. A lot of times though, uh, as an app developer, you'll be nesting these. So in the initial layout that I showed earlier, this is a linear layout. This is a linear layout. This is a linear layout. This is a linear layout, and these are linear layouts. All of these are nested within a relative layout. In this case, I have this one is the center is the centered element, and these are all nested around it based upon where the linear layouts are. So this, if this is one big linear layout here, I have this one centered in the parent, and I have this one that is referencing it above whatever this tech, whatever I label this linear layout. All the rest of these, this one's listed, this one is uh, has a property of being below this layout. This, lin this linear layout here is below this linear layout. And these buttons in their own linear layout are below this linear layout here. So that'll show you why, that'll show you how you can change around the way you want your layouts to actually look. So we're moving on to the actual views that you can put inside of these layouts now. This is where you actually add content to the application and make it interactive for the user. We've already gone over a little bit of the text view, but I'm going to go over a little bit more about it, <coughs> such as, like I mentioned earlier, you can make the text bold or you can change the size. So as you can see here, I have a text size here, which is 12 SP. 12 SP, SP is, is a characteristic used for size pixels for text on an Android application. That's the way they set that up. There's two different ways, there's two different ways you can declare pixels on it. In this case, we have, we have the size pixel, the, the text, which is um, independent size pixels based upon the text that you want to use. And if you look down here where I have padding bottom, I have DP, those are density independent pixels. So if you look at, if you look at an Android app, if you look at the resolution of Android devices all around, throughout the years, Android device res resolution has changed from really small 320 by 240 displays all the way up to really big 320 by 1440, if I'm wrong. But anyway, if you were to have a button that is 30 pixels by 30 pixels on a 320 by 240 display, it would be much larger than it would be on my 2250 by 1440 display. So what this does is it is it makes the density, it makes the size of that button completely independent of what the density is, and it'll actually base the size more upon what the size, what the smaller, what, what the smaller resolution button will look like. So that way, no matter which device I put it on, it'll look the exact same. Text style here, that's just simply how the text is going to look. You can choose to be either bold or italic. In the quotations here, the quotations are pretty much how you decide decide what are what arguments you're going to have for the properties. Oh, also Android text. Two things. One major thing about this. This is both depending on how you're going to use it, good and bad practice. In the case of simplicity here, we're simply declaring the text in here as a static variable quantity. Most of the time, if an app is going to be used internationally. That value will actually be stored in a file called strings.xml, and you will reference that here using uh, the same way I did the at ID, except instead you would have at strings slash the name of whatever string it is you're looking for. <coughs> That's so that way, again, when you go internationally with apps, users can choose which language they want to use, and the app will reference a different strings, a different strings resource file in order to change the language of the app without the developer having to go through and, re and reset all of those values inside of the program itself.
Image views. <coughs> oh, I have that separate wrap content. That's not supposed to be there. Anyway. So an image view is simply displaying an image. As you saw above, above the title of the app, I had it, an image of a coffee cup. Let me see. Let me pull this up. Let me see if it wants to behave now. That's better. <coughs> Okay, if you look here, you can see my image view, which is this, which is this little coffee cup here. So I've declared a couple of things in here. Most importantly, what I was stating earlier was my layout width and my layout height are static. Since I have several different sizes of the picture itself for the different application, for the different devices that it will be on, I only want my picture, no matter what, to be this size based upon what device I'm on. So I declared it as 150 by 150 density independent pixels. So no matter what, whether I, whether I go to a higher res device or a lower res device, this coffee cup will look exactly the same in each one of them. The important thing in image view though is the source image itself. So if I open up the project pane on the left, under the drawable folder, which is referenced to the There we go. If we look in the source folder here, all on the sides here in drawable, under the folder java.ping, I have my pictures, which are all listed for different, de for different de uh, pixel densities. All these little symbols and parentheses um, specify what kind of uh, de uh, pixel density on the device that will be used when that image will be used, in which case we have high, low, mid, extra high, extra, extra high density pic uh, pixel density per device. But so since I have the java.ping in here, if you look at the source here, I'm referencing the drawable folder and I'm pulling out, jo and I'm pulling out the java image to actually make my copy come appear on the app itself. Very simply, a button. There's not really much more to it. It does exactly what it's expected to do. It sits there and waits for somebody to click on it. And when you click on it, you can make things happen with it. Uh, same declarations for pretty much everything else, which is why I left only just the width and height, because again, those are extremely important and have to be defined for every single view object that you place in your app. They cannot be stressed enough for that. So when people put, the, put this thing on there and wonder why it's not showing up, those will be the first things that anybody will look for when it's broken. While well, explaining how to add functionality to that in a little while, that is based, that is based upon a different parameter. Which, we're actually going to start doing that? No. We're going to change how we're I'm going to show you guys the nesting that we have going on in our layouts for the device. So as we can see in this code, oh, that's, that's I have at, at the top, this whole thing is, this whole app itself is shown in a linear layout. And inside of that, in the first set, where the image and the first set of text are stored, those are both relative, those are relative layouts. Because in a linear layout, you actually can't center the object itself inside of the inside of the parent. No matter what, in a linear layout, it will always set the layout to, all, to be what is on the furthest left of the display. So if I were to pull that relative layout out like this, Notice how, my, how the coffee cup and my title of Just Java have both shifted all the way back over to the left. It's because there's no, this 
center horizontal does not exist inside of linear layout. So in order to center something like that in the display, I have to have it. I have to have that parameter be defined within a relative layout. So in order to keep those centered, I place them within a relative layout. So if you'll notice, my relative, my relative layouts in this case. This is going to be, this is what's all going to be decided for my uh, text view, my quantity here, which is going to have the incremental within it. If anybody notices, I'm not declaring any kind of ID inside of this. Can anybody tell me why, why I don't need an ID for these relative layouts to stack properly? <coughs> So again, same as before, I have no ID defined for these relative layouts. Can anybody tell me why I'm not worried about whether they'll stack in the proper order or not? What's that again? And why is that? Uh, well, so I'm looking for something a little bit more different. It's because it's because of something that's in the code that's part of the rel that's not part of the relative layout, but it's where the layout is residing. It's because the relative layout is in a linear layout, so I don't need to define any kind of ID for these re for these relative layouts because I know since I'm declaring them in a way that. I will have each of these relative layouts stack in the way I want them to, as long as they appear in the correct order in the XML. If I were to make this in a relative layout, I would have to declare an IDE for each one of these relative layouts. So just another example here. So here's where it gets a little, gets a little awkward. So inside this main linear layout here, just below the just job icon here, I have a small relative layout. Inside that small relative layout, I have a small linear layout. The small linear layout only holds the buttons for the increment. Which when you click a button, that'll become a button that'll add and subtract one from this little incremented value zero here. And so in order to that was mostly in order to make sure that I kept these items centered. Originally, when this app, when they have you initially write this app inside of the Audacity course, they will spend a crap ton of time with the whole thing in like the upper left hand corner. It just looks ugly. Nobody wants to deal with an app where everything's in the upper left hand corner. Everybody likes things centered in their apps. So I, so I declared them within a rel within a relative layout here and moved them to the center so they be so they be more accessible and make the whole app itself look more presentable, in my opinion. Whether whether you like it or not, I don't care. It's my app, not yours. Ah, check boxes. I do not have a slide for these because these were a last minute addition. I'm assuming everybody knows these are check boxes right here. So check box has the same has the same um, same declarations as most of the other things. You'll notice that pretty much all XML things have very, very similar declarations and very, very similar property definitions. Just to make life easier for everybody. So I declare my checkbox, closing tag here. I got a bunch of little things here to define what the text box is, is what it's gonna say, and here's the function for calling up what I want it to do. This is where I'm gonna explain how functionality inside of an Android app works. Okay, so, as the first line says, making an interface, you can make an interface really pretty in Android if you, if you try hard and work a long time on it. But if nobody does anything, but if it doesn't do anything, what's the point of the app? I may as well just have a fancy wallpaper with a button if it doesn't do anything. So, in order to do that, we have to declare what is going to happen when the, when the uh, view that's on our device is going to be interactive. In order to do that, as you saw in the checkbox, we have to declare the on-click parameter.
Down here is the on-click parameter. So what this on-click parameter means, when I click one of these little checkboxes here, it's going to trigger a function, in this case, that is want value. Or, sorry, once I click one of these checkboxes, it'll set, it'll set a function that is want value. I'll show how that function works later. The button will probably be just as good of an example for this, because the email doesn't do much. There we go. So this button right here, my subtraction button. When I click that button, the, it'll, it'll trigger a function called in my app called someone. And what that'll do is it'll take the little incremented value here and it'll subtract one from it. So that's really much it for now with the XML. I think we're gonna move on to some Java right now. So in the Java, so Android is written, Android apps are written entirely in Java. Now you've all done Java before, and you all know, and you all know the basics of how the how the language works. Well, Android messes all that up. When you declare a new activity in Android, it sets most of the basic parameters that you would generally have to define yourself for a Java application for you. So it makes you really lazy in the process. Unless you want to write an Android app in a text editor, in which case I'm so sorry for you. Because it's extremely difficult without, without using the ID. So when you declare an activity, which I'm going to pull up the main activity for this app here, the first thing it's going to show you is it's going to show you the class, what the name of the activity is, and you can name the main activity whatever you want. I just chose to leave it main activity, so I remember that it's a main activity. And depending upon what you're going to use, what uh, SDK you're going to use with it, it'll either give you extends activity or extends app compatibility activity. Extending app compatibility activity is much nicer because in my um, in my layout here, if you notice, I have this really pretty blue bar at the top. That is what app compat activity allows me to use. It allows me to use a toolbar at the top there. Why? It's a good question. And nobody seemed to figure out why exactly Google doesn't put this in the rest of the game. So there we so if one of you one of you figures it out, let me know. Because I I'm sure I'm certainly not, not sure right now. And I've tried a bunch of different methods to figure that out. But if I were to change this just to a simple activity. But this would disappear. It's supposed to disappear. Sometimes the synchronization on the, on the uh, Android Studio doesn't work as properly as it should. But anyway, that's that's for something for if you guys want to mess around. If you guys want to mess around with the top bar. So this function. So this function right here, the onCreate function. This is the first thing that's called on your apps. Sorry. This is the first thing that's called on your app's main activity, and this is the first set of code that will run when this when this activity this entire activity is created. So I'll explain that later when we get into um, launching launching activities from different apps and things like that. But for now, uh, this is essentially the same as your main as your main for any other Java app, any other uh, Java program that you've written. Now, underneath here, I have a bunch of different functions written down, and they're very simple void functions. Because I only intend for them to do simple, I only intend for them to do simple things. Ignore the submit work. We'll get to that a little later, because that's, that's scary code. But, um, so you see I have an add one function, and I have a sum one function. Now, I have view view as an argument for these. That means that when I call this function, this is looking for an argument call from an XML view. In which case, this function is triggered by a button view, or this function is triggered by a text view, or something like that. I can't simply call the add one function from a different function inside of this application without some form of view argument. 
Now this will simply take a copy number, take, uh, I declare a copy number as a private variable up top here. Just a few little private variables to, keep, to get me going. It'll increment that number and I'll explain why, and it will display it all. I'll explain how that part works in just a minute. And it'll update the display to show you that number. I really wish I could make this app live right now, but unfortunately, I accidentally closed the project. <coughs> so with these onCreate functions and things like that, there's also several other methods that are required for the different life cycle of an app. How many people, how many people know the life cycle of an Android app? Okay, there are several stages in an app's life cycle. There's the point where the app is created, which is where the onCreate function is. There's the onPause life uh, stage, where if you hit the home button, or you go to a different app, it'll pause this app and place everything of its, of its information in the background. There's the onResume, which when you go into the recent menu, and you choose this app again to become the front app on your device, it'll run that code, probably open up some data that was there before, close to that, uh, and restore a state that was there before, and on destroy. That is when you go home and you hit recent and you swipe away to kill the app, the on destroy function is called. Normally an on destroy is generally meant to um, free memory for any large object that was created in the app. Um, any kind of data that's not needed anymore, so that way you can keep the memory both on the app small and on the device small until such a time as when you need it again. So, as I said before, Android's written in Java, so a lot of the stuff that you learn you'll figure out pretty quickly and easily. So it's a really nice step. It's a really nice step for people who are who enjoy writing Java and are looking to get more practice with it. Although I wouldn't recommend it as a first language because as you see the learning learning curve is exactly the smallest thing in the world. But anyway, all the major things that you learn in Java are there. The only things that are weird are activities, broadcast receivers, and services. Oh. And interfaces, depending on if you use them or not. Sometimes they can be a little intimidating, but I'll make it really simple for this. So, we've already seen an activity. An activity is something that runs on the app when it's called. A broadcast receiver is a small signal that is the channel when the app is running an activity. So, the most common example of this is some form of downloader. If you're looking, you say I have an app, when I open up the app, it's going to go online. It's going to grab a file and it's going to download that file to my device. So the download is going to declare a broadcast receiver that will tell the that will tell the address to pay. I'm downloading something. So give me priority with the HTTP calls so that way I can go to the, I can go to this website. I can download the I can download the system. Uh, I can download the file that I need. And then when I'm done, I'll let you know that I'm done so you can put up a notification to the user. And that's what it does. So in order to do that, you have to declare an abstract broadcast receiver. I don't know if you want to do it in the background or not, and that's why I skipped that part because that's going to get really fast. Services, you can have an app have a main activity, or you can have it run as a service, in which case it doesn't have any actual interface. It'll simply you trigger it, and it'll constantly run in the background. Or you can trigger it on boot, and it'll constantly run in the background. Um, chat heads, Facebook chat heads are a good example. They're a service. You leave them up, if you leave them up, they leave a little bubble in the corner of your screen. That is a service that they have running in the background with an interface on top of it. A very small interface that sits in the location that you chose for your device. So that's how that's how a service works. You can't. You can't kill it. You have to go. You can't kill it via recent or anything like that. You have to physically go in and disable the entire and kill the entire app in order for the service to be stopped. And interfaces. Interfaces. How many of you people have used an interface before? Have seen an interface or can tell me what the term is? Okay. An interface is a skeleton to the methods that this app will 
that this app will implement. So I have an example of an interface because I made this app way more complicated than before. So I just have a very simple interface here which declares a pair of buttons, which is actually pretty nice because I have a like 15 buttons before. But, so it's going it's to display all method and I calculate price method. Those are what are called inside of my main class to display my price and to calculate my price. And they're all implemented within this fine price implementation class. <coughs> So, in this fine price implementation class, I want to look at this line first here, where we have a main activity, main act. So, in order for this class to actually change anything on the app, in the case of the display that we have going on with this app, when you click one of these increment buttons here, it'll increment and update this number here. It'll also display a price down here, all as you click it. In order for that to happen, you have to pass the main activity, you have to pass the interface for the main activity into your, in, your interface so that way you can change any views that are inside of that activity. In order to do that, So that way I can use that implementation and change around how my views look inside of my main activity here. I use this line, which is the implementation of this line and is passing the activity that is that's currently inside of it. This is where my main this 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 here is my main activity, which is going into my price implementation of my interface. So using that main, I can now update my whole interface here with what, using whatever views I want. In order to do that, you notice these lines here. Find view by ID. Remember how we declared all of these different IDs early on with all the different views? This is how you manipulate them programmatically using Java. I'm declaring that this price view is a text view. I'm also casting a text, a text view here through my main activity, which I've defined up here after I pass the argument through. Find view by ID. So since we declared the IDs, we can call upon the IDs inside of our Java application and change whatever, whatever parameter we want on the, on the um, view. Can, has anybody ever heard of uh, R? You, what's R? Uh, language, yeah. This is for data mining or something like that. Yes, but you're wrong. <laughs> so, Android pre-compiles a lot of your code as you're writing it. In this case, Android pre-compiles it into an object called R. R is an intermediary step between the actual program and the app itself. So R is where all of your little IDs, all of your little code, all of that stuff is um, stored for future use that way. Not only can you speed up compilation later, but you can also test to make sure things that you're looking for actually exist. In this case, my object R is going to have my, I'm searching under the IDs for my object R. I'm looking for my price text view, which is my, which is the updater, which is the uh, text view on my app that shows what the price is. So whenever this, so since I made this declaration, I can modify any parameter I want in there. In this case, I've chosen to change what the quantity is. Oh, sorry, I'm going price view quantity, my bad. Price view, there it is. So I am simply calling a price calculation, which is up here. And it's very, very simple arithmetic. I hope I don't need to explain that to anybody. It would be really disappointing if I had to at this point. And from there, I am gonna set, I'm gonna change the text of my price view to this little private string up here. 
which is going to have my total value and the, and the value that's going to have my price. So since, since I'm, again, since I'm passing through all of my views from the main activity, I can manipulate them as I see fit here. And I only want to change the text. I can change the color if I wanted to, or I can move it around and make it do all kinds of things. Yeah, it's whatever thing, but we don't, we don't need that right now. Okay, so now we're going to get into the next step, which is where when you click a button, you want to launch, you want to say, you want to do something. Instead of simply just changing around the current view, we're going to launch an entirely different activity to do something different. So that's what I have happen when I press the total button on this app. Oop, that was a wrong button. We'll let that look back. But anyway, so I have another activity here declared, which is order activity, with a completely different layout set here. So if you'll notice, it looks absolutely nothing like what my original layout was. Once you hit your order button, this is similar to what you'll see. It kind of goes more like... So say I order one coffee and I wanted cream and sugar only. This is what the this is what the user will see afterwards. So launching that activity, I had to do several different things. I had to pass a number of different variables into that, and I had to pass, and I had to do a couple of interface updates to make that happen. This is where we get to the core of how Android handles everything, which are called intents. Intent, intents are triggers throughout the system that cause activities or services or methods to happen. So if I go back to my main class here, down here you'll see a declaration of an intent. So the intents take two arguments: the initial class that's being called upon, and the class and the class or activity that you're actually going to implement with this intent. In this case, the main activity is what's calling this intent, which is this. And I'm going to go to my order activity class, which is another, which is the other activity of the interface that I showed you. But, like I said, we're passing parameters into this. An intent initially does have a bundle of data that goes with it. But it's not much. It just simply it just simply uh, maps back to what the original main activity of the application is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put extra data. In this case, I'm going to pass a couple of ints and a few booleans and uh, pass a string. Oh, what a letdown! I didn't put a string. But anyway, so these two uh, these two values here, I am passing through integers. And these three values here, I am going to pass through booleans. So notice how each of these has a string in front of them. In front of them, that is the identification string for the data inside of this intent, plus whatever variable I want to pass into it. So those are the two arguments you need when you are putting any extra, any extra into an intent, which is an identification for the data and, and the actual data itself. So after I put the data in there, I am now going to start that activity with the intent, which is this call right here, start activity intent. Now if we go over to the activity that I'm triggering, which is the order activity,
here in this very, very ugly block of code is where I'm receiving the intent. So now this is where the, this is where it gets a little awkward with how the intents are handled. Notice here, I have a call of get intent. So this activity is going to take any data from the intent that's passed by the main activity, and it's just going to grab it all at once. So that means that it can only be triggered by the act, by that activity that calls it, and it will only receive data from that activity that calls it, no matter what no matter what other activities are running at the time. From that get intent. I'm going to take that and I'm going to split it into the exact data that I'm looking for, in which case both of those integers and all three of those Booleans. Now notice how I have two different calls here, get in extra, get Boolean extra. That specifically states what kind of data I'll be getting with this get, in, with this get intent. And here is where we're reusing that identification string that we passed through earlier. So I'm looking for these exact strings. Now these variables here, I would assume that I don't want them to always be false, right? It'd be really disappointing if somebody hit a checkbox and it still registers as false. So instead, what these actually are is if no intent is passed through, if no value is passed through this intent, what is the default for that? So if I don't have any integer values for display value or coffee count, it'll be zero. Same thing, same thing if I have, um, if there's no check mark for milk, cream, or sugar. If I don't pass any through, through those intents, they'll by default be false. So from there, I'm going to unspool all that, all that intent nonsense. And I have it assigned to all the variables. And I'm going to update them on my view. Again, I'm having a call to my text view here, finding the view by ID. Notice how I don't have, notice how in my implementation here, if I pull up my interface implementation, mm. notice how right about here in the code, I'm calling main.findViewById. That means that I'm calling it on the main that was passed through this argument. But notice how in this one, I don't have that call. Can anybody make a guess as to why? Come on, guys. What's that? Yes, that is a new activity, but there is another reason behind that. It. It's because I'm not calling it on any other activity besides this current activity. So by default, if you don't put an argument inside of that, or pass any kind of view into it, it'll choose the uh, it'll choose the layout for what uh, what activity you're currently working on, and from there it'll update that it'll update that view only. So if you pass through a view of your main class but don't actually call it anywhere, it won't update anything. But if you call this ability, if you call this in here but don't call that other view that you're trying to pass through, it won't update anything. But it'll update something on your main on your current activity view. Which, if you're passing through a different view, you probably don't want that. You'll be horribly confused as to why it's broken later. So, when we declare a new activity, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can just simply make a new Java class file, set it up as an activity using the headers using the headers that we showed earlier, like this. Pretty simple call. Pretty simple, pretty simple primary to define what the class is going to be. And the extension? Not that difficult. Anybody can probably write this in just a simple and just a simple Android class after that. But what makes it special are the extras that are thrown in there. 